Hi guys, welcome to another Learn Electronics Repair video. I was given this by one of the traders on the uh, car boot sale for free. He said, oh, he knows what I do. I've been trying to get him to give me some uh, games consoles and things to look at that he knows are faulty. And uh, he said, oh, you can have this. And it's just something different. It's a little portable CD player radio. It's a bit battered. Uh, if I hold that down, I'm sure you can hear something rattling around inside it. So I thought, yeah, let's have a look at something for fun. Yeah, just see if we can fix these sort of things. So I have it plugged into the power. Um, I'll swing the uh, camera around so the light bulb is actually up here. We're connected via the light bulb. Let's switch it on. And nothing happens. So it's either drawing no power at all or it's drawing so little power that the light bulb doesn't light up. But given the fact there's something loose in here, I thought we'd better have a look. So let's uh, unplug it and see if we can get this thing open. It looks like some screws underneath it. Let's have a look at what we've got here. See if we can have some fun with it. Okay, well, we, we're inside it. So we have a little radio board here. Uh, we have a, a main board. And we have a, a little power supply. So this is a linear power supply, not switch mode. So we have a transformer going to this little board here. So this is stepping the voltage down. This... Obviously, I think you've all seen this before. Well, let me zoom in. There we go. So we can see four diodes here. And if you've seen a few of my videos, you'll recognize this as wired as a bridge rectifier. Uh, we have a smoothing capacitor, uh, probably a voltage regulator or something like that. And then it sort of goes up into the main PCB for the CD player and mp3 player so first thing with this would be to see a is a fuse any good it looks okay and then let's see if we have any power getting into this little board i have the meter on diode mode but this will also show continuity we get a zero yeah so the fuse is okay then we have these diodes which we might as well just check and they, those two are okay and the other way round for the other two yeah they're okay so these two ends will be the positive supply connected together and these will be the negative supply connected together so we can check here to see if we have any power getting into our unit uh, let's connect the mains power again and see what it's doing i have the switch switched off at the moment so i'll just uh, connect the lead. I've noticed there's no fuse on the input. So we're on there and we can switch on. Right, we switched on now. So if we go to volts, I'll just uh, set the range on the meter. Okay, we're on volts. So we should have power coming out of the bridge rectifier. This is the negative side, either of these two, and either end is a positive. So let's see what we got. Oh, I think we have some voltage here. Yeah, we have about 15 volts there, 14.5, coming into this board. So I'm assuming that then goes out on this little connector, which looks actually like it might be falling off the board. I'll just reseat that. So uh, switch the power off. And I'll just... Uh, yeah, that's seated in there properly. I'll put something underneath it just to lift it, just hit the strain off these wires a little bit. See if we can get this in there. Yeah. So it's taken the strain off the wires. So there's no... Oh yes, there were some voltages marked here. So you can see we have ground ground. Then it says DC. It's kind of like back to front, 7.5 and 12.5 volts. So I'm assuming that's on here. So we'll switch it back on again, and let's have a look to see what voltage we actually have. The power's on. So we know from the markings, this is ground. 
and then we should have some output voltages so 12.5 and we have 14.4 so that's higher than it says 7.5 is 8.2 so they're all actually higher than they say what's this one 14.5 the one that just says DC written upside down plus and then this is ground so we have some power supplies going down into the main unit albeit the voltages seem to be a little bit higher than you would expect I've also figured out what was rattling around inside this is just a bit of broken plastic from the case we have a little switch on the side here that basically has four positions so we have off mp3 tuner and cd and it's a little bit stiff this switch i mean i'm having some difficulty in moving it so that's off position one position two and then it doesn't seem to want to go to the other position so yeah yeah that switch seems a little bit dodgy so we have position one off one two and that doesn't want to go into the position yeah it is switching over but it's just dodgy it's a dodgy switch let's have a look to see if we can see any continuity here because if i switch this on so mp3 and then the next one is tuner so that should be a tuner now if i switch this on we'll connect the little power board back up again on the uh, little cable one moment okay it's plugged in so this should now power up you can see the front of it let's get some power on it okay the power's on but you can see nothing lights up yeah there's no nothing on the display and yet that should be switched on just moving the switch doesn't seem to have any effect yeah so let's see if we can tell if this switch is any good or not just unplug the power again try and balance this out of the way somewhere it's probably easier to take this off there we go so you can see the switch is here and you would assume that if we switch it off there's probably no continuity between any of the pins i'm in continuity mode so let's have a look so i don't see anything here meters working yes i don't see anything here oh that one seems to go to well something was going to there So I have continuity to here. Is it the same on the other side? No. So the first one is going to this one. And you just kind of assume there's two sliders here. And this side would be in the same position, which is to here. And it doesn't go. Okay. Let's just check the other one. So nothing there. These two are actually wired together anyway here on the PCB. Okay. We seem to have some continuity there. So we're finding some connections on it. But this kind of like is in a different position to the other side. I don't know if that means the switch is faulty or it's just some special sort of switch. Let's go... Right, I've switched it to the next position. What have we got now? Well, something's changed on this side. Yeah, it's not got continuity to here anymore. Is this one still in the same position? No, so the switch is doing something. Let's go to the third position. Okay. What do we have now? All open. Yeah, that switch doesn't seem to be operating in any sort of sensible 
way to me. So I think we'll take a circuit board off and let's have a look to see if we can figure out how this switch should be operating and if it's okay. Okay, I've got the circuit board off. Um, so the switch now seems to be operating better. Two, three. Yeah, I can, at least I can get all the positions now. Just uh, get a bit of switch cleaner inside. This is WD-40, a uh, switch cleaner in Spanish, basically. Um, you know, WD-40 is like the perfect product because like everything else, like washing powder and detergents and things, they always have new improved ones, yeah, but we're still on WD-40, like we should be on like, WD-46 or something by now, you'd think, wouldn't you? So it must be a perfect product, yeah. I'm gonna spray this into the switch. I'll get a bit of a kitchen roll. Here we go. Like magic, a bit of kitchy metal. Let's uh, get some of this into the switch. Okay. Let's we'll see if that actually helps. Otherwise, I have to take a switch off and try and figure out what the contacts are supposed to be doing. Okay, so that's going to go. Go. Let's see. And I'll zoom down. I think we can assume inside here are like two metal sliders that effectively make contacts. Can't see anything down inside there, but I'm sure that's what we would have. So in the off position, which is this is now in the off position, you would kind of think there's either no contact or maybe a contact or something. That's just my meter wanting to go to sleep. I'll just change the uh, modes, keep it awake. Okay. Continuity. But there's nothing there. Is there any contacts at all on this side? No. And the switch is off, so you kind of expect that. What about the other side? There's nothing there. So this does have a contact on this side from here to here when it's in an off position. But if we go on the other side of the switch, oh yeah, we do have, maybe I was not making a good contact. So it looks like this end connects to this terminal when it's off. And this side connects to this terminal. And then these two are just connected together, you can see, on this side. So that's in the first position. Let's go for the second position. Position two. Let's have a look again. So this one was connecting to here. Is it now connecting to here? No. Is this connecting to here? No. No. So none of those connected there. Do any connect to this one? Let's see. Yeah, so we have a connection to there. So it's definitely switching from here to here. Or from here to here. I wonder if this one's the wiper. And then in the third position, does it go to here? Yeah. And in the fourth position, it goes to here. So we can say that the, the one with the red leaves at the moment is effectively like the wiper of the switch. Yeah, position one, position two, position three, position four. Okay. So I've got the other side because you would assume it will be the same. So position one. I think we had these. Yes. Position two. Get a connection on Yep, position three should go to here. It's a bit awkward to get a connection, but let's, I think I have these. Hmm, that's, yeah, it is. Position four should be here, he's still here. He's about to get it. Yeah. This side doesn't seem to be behaving the same as the other side. This side is quite obvious, we can do it again. Position one, got a connection to there. 
and here to here. Yeah. Second position. Wiper to here. Wiper to here. Okay. Third position. Wiper to here. And wiper to here. Yeah. Fourth position. Wiper to here. And wiper to here. Okay. That seems to be functioning actually now. Maybe that's what the problem is with this. I think I'll just resolder these. It'll look a little bit messy. Now let's try it again. Because the switch effectively is a mechanical device, there's some possibility we might have some bad connections down here as well so we'll just uh, go over them just to make sure we're happy with them now let's try this again and let's see if it switches on now oops I made a solder bridge there I'll soon uh, sort that out one moment what that flux on it let's try and just do it without solder bridge no. One more go. No. Okay, we got a bit of solder braid. There we go. And I can just add a little bit of solder on them again. That one's okay. That one's okay. Yeah, they're all okay. Let's give it a go. I've put it back together. I've just put one screw in here just to hold it in place. And I haven't put the little uh, plastic activator on the switch. I can just switch it. So that's off. That's the first position. That's the second position. So I'm sure, yes. Second position is the radio. So let's power it up now and see if it does anything. Well, once again, it's basically it's dead. I don't have anything lit up. We can just oh, the speakers are making a clicking noise now. If you can hear it, so there's power getting into it, but we still don't have anything working. So we'll have to look a little bit further and see what's going on with this. I don't know if you could hear it clearly, but I was getting like a little thud on the speakers when I was switching the switch on and off. So I'm pretty sure there's power getting into this. This chip, I think, is probably the amplifier, the actual audio amplifier. Um, it's got a part number on it, uh, CMHCSOHJ6. Uh, what did it say on it, if anything? Just you know, a bit of gunge on it. Scrape that stuff off it a little bit. D925. I'll just clean it up. Okay. I used a bit of isopropyl alcohol and wiped the stuff off it. So it says D9258PH. That's possibly the part number. So we can look for a data sheet for this, but I'm pretty sure this is going to be an audio amplifier, stereo. It looks that way, kind of like two halves, almost symmetrical. This one is a voltage regulator, and this one says 1117-33. So that's a 3.3 volt regulator, and it's almost certainly going to be powering this chip. The other one just says 1117A. So we can look at the data sheet for that, but again, it's going to be a voltage regulator. I think the next thing to do is to, te is to check to see if these regulators have the correct output voltage. And also see if we can find a data sheet on this and see if this has any power. I have some data sheets. So the LM1117-33 is a fixed voltage regulator as I believed, and the last two digits is the voltage, so 33 is 3.3. So it's this type of device, three lead. 
I'm not quite sure which is the surface mount one, but it's one of these two. And you can see if we find the pin out. Pin one is a just or ground. The output is on the center pin, and this is your input, so in and out. So that's that one. And we can test that to see if we have 3.3 volts. The other one, 1117A, A is actually adjustable. So this is a variable voltage regulator. And again, we have a pin out, which is the same. So in this case, this is we're using as an adjust pin, and you can buy using resistor network here, two resistors, you can set the output voltage, which is the same in and out as on the center. So although we don't know what it should be given in output, it's going to be a sensible voltage, you know, something we normally see, 2.5 or 5 or something like that. So we can check again to see if this is working. The other chip, which I thought was an audio amplifier, this one isn't at all, four channel motor driver drives tracking actuator, focus actuator, sled motor and loading motor with a CD-ROM. So this is actually driving the CD reader for the playing music. So the audio amplifier is somewhere else on our circuit board, probably on the other side. But we can certainly check these voltage regulators to see what we have. We have a little bit more information now. So the center pin of these voltage regulators effectively should give us some voltage and we can measure that from ground which we actually know is is the end of the wire here but to make life easy let's find where this goes onto the main board so we've got a ground somewhere over here it's probably pin one of the fixed regulator in actual fact because the other one will go to some resistors as an adjust pin but let's have a look so we'll just uh, put this onto uh, continuity again and let's see where this ground goes and I'm thinking it's pin one of one of these. Yeah, I was right, it goes there. But not the other one, because it's a variable regulator. So this is ground. Is this point ground? Yeah, this, this big metal tab on this chip, I'm actually on this. This is ground, so there's a good place for ground. Okay, so we know where we can take our measurements. Let's switch it on and let's have a look to see what we've got. So we want voltage. voltage right power is on we know where we can find the ground so i'll get onto ground and let's see what's on our voltage regulators well this doesn't appear to have anything on it and neither does this one but is it switched off with the switch no it's switched on so the switch is on. Let me just check again and make sure I've got a good ground connection. Okay. And what do we have on our voltage regulator? Well, let's look on the in. And we have nothing. What's on this one? We have nothing. So we have nothing coming in and nothing coming out of our voltage regulators. And yet we have. Yeah, you know, 8 volts coming from the little power supply board and 14 volts. So these regulators are giving us no voltage, which makes me think that somewhere the voltage isn't getting through and it must come from the on-off switch, you would think, over here. Or maybe it doesn't come directly from the on-off switch because you would think that these voltage regulators, the input voltage wouldn't be must much different from the output voltage otherwise they get very hot unless they supply a very low current so it's possible there's something on the other side of the board between the switch and here so i think we need to get the circuit board off again and let's see if we can trace where the voltage actually goes to i have the pcb out of the unit there's two chips on this side and i usually when i'm working on something unknown i like to just see what the chips are but i've also spotted this is where the voltage comes in and the voltages are marked here and this is a fuse so we can check if the fuse is any good and i'm still interested to see what these are this with the metal tab i'm now thinking this is the audio amplifier i'm not sure what this one does but i think we should have a look as well 
if for no other reason than just looking up chips and you kind of memorize them to some extent. It just helps you to familiarize. So when you see something again, you often just know what it is. You've seen the part number before. Let's put the meter onto continuity mode. Okay, we're on continuity mode. Is the fuse any good? Yeah, the fuse is okay. We can measure the voltages on here, but let's, as I say, just figure out what these two ICs are doing. This one is marked D8227, and I'm now convinced that is the amplifier. In fact, one of the speakers connects to here. Yeah, it's sort of saying two right, left, whatever here, yeah. So that's by that. D8227, but we can look it up. And what's this thing? TC4052B, I think that's some sort of CMOS logic chip, but we can have a look at that one as well. So the first thing we should check then is really, is there any voltage coming in on the cable here? Because although the cable looks okay, if it turns out this is our problem, and we find out later, we're going to be feeling pretty silly for not checking it in the first place. So let's go there, that's ground. And we have 14 and a half volts. And we have 8.2 volts. So we know the voltage is getting this far. Is it getting as far as the fuse? Ground again. So one end of the fuse, 14 and a half. The other end of the fuse, 14 and a half. So the voltage is getting this far. What happens if I switch the on off switch off? Have we still got voltage here? No. So when I switch the switch on, I've just switched it back on. So the on off switch is switching the voltage to here. I'll just try it in all three positions. Yeah, third position. Yeah, well, a bit lower. So let's switch the switch. Interestingly, in the last position, it's a bit lower. Maybe a bit of resistance in the contacts, but I don't think that's the problem. Uh, second position. Off. Yeah, so that's definitely switching the power on and off. Let's check again on our voltage regulator, see if we've got any voltage there now with the circuit board on the bench. Turn it over, here we go. Let's have a look. So we need a ground, and I was sure at this point here was actually ground. I can just check by measuring here and measuring on the end of the ribbon cable. I'll just do the other end because I can reach it. Yeah, 8 volts. 14 volts. So this is ground. So what have we got here? Nothing. Nothing. And coming in. Nothing. Nothing. So we've definitely got a problem. The power not getting this far. Let's see if we can trace it. Where do these voltage regulators get the power from? The input power? I mean, we don't have any. They're both connected together, the, the volts in. Well, 43 ohms, so they're connected via resistors. Oh yeah, I can see like a little resistor here on this one. It's not easy. 10 ohms, okay, so I have like a low value resistor. That goes to here. There's some things. Oh, I see, look, there's, there's wire links, one going to the other regulator and one going this way. And to be honest, you'd expect that to go to the switch, I would have thought. It seems like the most reasonable place to go. So let's get on uh, to this point here where these wire links are. Let's have a look. So this is our switch. We don't, we don't go. Well, that's when the switch is on. Hmm. Oh. They do go to the switch. Switch. Right, so they go to the switch, but they only go to the switch in the bottom position. So these regulators must only have power when it's switched to CD, and they mustn't be switched on. So that effectively probably powers these things. So let's have a look and see. Just uh, 
find the paroid. We've got some power on them now. So we have grounders here, so we've ground points. So have a look on our regulators again. Oh, okay, so that's 3.3 volts. And that's 1.5 volts, which is probably 1.5 for this. And I'm guessing the 3.3 is for this as well. So does that mean this is working? Let me just uh, switch the power off. I'll put it back together. Let's see what happens. Okay, I've sort of, sort of half put it back together. Let's see. Oh, it is. It's it's working. It says no, no disc. I guess. Open the lid. Yeah, it's reacting to that as well. Okay, so we now do have power. So it appears that the only time we have power is when the switch is in that third position. That was a bit of a red herring. Never mind. Let's see if we can find a CD and give it a try. So we can say it is working. I mean, I don't have any audio CDs to play, unfortunately, at the moment. I'll have to grab one at the weekend at the car boot, some rubbish just to test with it. Unless I'm finding anything decent to test with. <laughs> but having said that, if we switch to radio, we get no output. There's no no audio coming from the radio. So I would have thought there would be. The other position says MP3, but it actually says MP3 link. And I'm pretty sure that actually is just connecting to the little audio input here because it would says mp3 link next to it because now the actual player is switched off so i've connected that to my uh, computer so let's see if we can play some music through this off the computer i've switched it then to the auxiliary in if you like the mp3 link let's see if it actually is working is the audio amplifier working oh well, yeah it definitely is so uh, we can say 100% we've got a uh, good amplifier. So why is the... Uh... Okay. So, so the question is then, why is the radio board not working? I mean, that's fine, yeah, that's fine. Let's have a look at the uh, radio. And see what wrong and see what's wrong with that. Well the radio board looks fairly simple to me. I mean we have the obviously the tuner here. We have four connections only. So we have right and left audio. We have ground and we have five volts. And that will connect back into this board and I'm pretty sure we can figure out that the la right and left audio go to that little multiplexer I see that selects the input. And yet when we go to radio we don't get any sound and we're on radio tuner now. So let's have a look. The connections are marked on here quite clearly for us. So this one is ground. So do we have any voltage supply to the radio? Well yes we have 5 volts so we've got a supply to it and I can just switch over if we go back over to line in that should go away yeah it, oh yeah it's dropping away there's a capacitor obviously discharging somewhere if we go back to radio we have five volts so we've got power to the radio tuner why are we not getting any audio out of it well, I think the first thing we'll have to do is try and just figure out if the audio is coming through to the amplifier. So if I just get my finger and we'll disconnect this uh, connection here to the radio board. I'll just switch it off one moment while I do it. But yeah, I have it unplugged now. So I've disconnected the wire. The orange one coming in is one of the audio channels so these first two on this end of the board are actually our audio inputs so let's see if we get any sound by just touching them to do this i'll just take the meter probe and just actually touch it with my finger 
and then touch the audio inputs on here and see if you get any buzzing noise can you hear it yeah so we've definitely got the amplifier working that's the first one this is the second one yeah that's the other speaker so it's quite obvious the audio input is working but we've got no audio coming out of our um, board there's a little switch here am and fm let's connect it back up again I'll just switched off okay okay we're back on i'm switching the switch and it's not making any difference and there's a tuning knob underneath yeah that, that's having no effect at all so it appears our little radio board has some sort of problem again i'll just double check to make sure that we have uh, power again that's the audio input so power is coming in on here Five volts. Let's take this board out and let's have a look to see if we can see anything obviously wrong with it. I've taken the screws out, but I can't get this off. It's attached by the tuning indicator in here to the bottom. But as much as I try, I can't seem to get this knob off. If I see it's attached to that, and I've given it quite a bit of force, but it just doesn't want to seem to come off and then the same with this board if that's pushed into the end of it just give it i've given it quite a lot of force and it doesn't seem to want to come off but we might be able to have a look from this side at least and see if we can figure out what's wrong with it and whether we actually do need to remove the pcb there's one i see on here which is this toshiba uh ta let's see what is it can you get the eyes TA2111NG. So let's have a look at that. I'm pretty sure that's effectively the radio because this seems to be a single sided PCB. I mean, I don't know if there's anything on the other side of it at the moment. But let's have a look at this part number and see what the data sheet says. I found the data sheet. So this is a 3 volt AM FM single chip tuner I see. So this basically is the entire radio. It says it needs a three volt supply. We know we have five volts coming onto the board, so I'm assuming there's a voltage regulator somewhere. This is a block diagram. So we can see VCC, but none of this actually goes into the chip apart from this switch, AM, FM. So it looks in the AM position. We have three volts on this chip on this pin of this chip sorry on pin 16 other than that we have three volts which finds its way round to pin 22 so 22 is the vcc so we can check for three volts on here and we can check for three volts on 16 as well with it in am position we'll try to fix the am position first because the frequencies are lower so it's going to be easier to do given the equipment i have here Assuming we can get some sound on AM, then we can try FM. But at the moment, we have no sound on both, which makes me think maybe this chip has no power or has a problem. We then have some typical voltages on the various pins that you can see here, listing the various pins. So we can see pin 16 has 3 volts when you're in AM position. Yeah, we knew about that. 3 volts on there and we can see we have 3 volts on oh in fact all these have 3 volts 20, 21, 22, 23 ok so we have plenty of places to look for 3 volts let's have a look what's on our chip and see what we have the chip is a 24 pin chip 12 pins each side so we know where to look first of all we'll just make sure we've got a good ground on, on here is good and we have the 5 volts coming in so pin 16, that's 13, 14, 15. This is pin 16. Should have a 3 volt supply according to the data sheet. And we've got 5. 
I guess that means all these ones are five as well. Mm. Yeah. That's three, 23, 22, 21. 20. So, we have five volts on this chip, which, according to the data sheet, isn't right. There's a little transistor here, if it is a transistor or a voltage regulator. Let's have a look. So that's almost zero. That's one volt. And that's almost zero. So it's not a voltage regulator. So the main question is, do we have too much voltage on here? Well, where's this five volt coming from? I mean, the five volts coming from somewhere and it looks like it's not coming on this board. So for example, if I switch the power off and we check from the five volts coming in, which is clearly marked as five volts. So it must be correct. The five volts coming in, do you go to these pins, especially pin 16, 13, 14, 15, 16. Go on to resistance range, let's have a look. Let's have to switch it to resistance. Yeah, so like 13, 14, 15, 16. Well, it, it goes there through a kind of like a varying resistance. Doesn't really give me a very stable reading. 17 ohms, 16, 17 ohms. Well, it does basically go there. Does it go into these as well? No, but the block diagram didn't say it went directly to there either what we got oh, 10 ohms yeah so there's a lot of low resistances on here 25 ohms 57 ohms 16 ohms well we could only assume this 5 volt is correct because it's marked as 5 volt and I'm a bit surprised the fact the data sheet says it's a 3 volt chip, then why don't we have a, a 3 volt supply to it? The only other assumption is somewhere on here is supposed to be a voltage regulator that maybe isn't working, that's supposed to drop it to 3 volts. I had another quick look at the data sheet. We've also got VCC on pin 6 that we need to test. And just looking down through the data sheet. It mentions VCC, which is a power supply, maximum ratings could be eight. So maybe the five volts is fine with this chip. I mean, it's below the maximum rating. Let's have a look on pin six to see if we have any power there. We're on voltage range then, we've powered up. So let's see what's on pin six. I'm expecting this to have power, to be quite honest. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, five volts, the same as all the other ones have. So the next thing then to check to see if this chip is working is are the local oscillators running? Now I'll just explain to you first what a local oscillator is and basically how it works. And then we can check to see if ours is working. First of all though, we said in the meter probes, we're going to need a piece of paper, yeah? Brief history of radio part one, yeah. So a radio wave, which is carrying your audio, your music or voice, or for that matter, pictures with television, is a high frequency AC signal, normally in the hundreds of kilohertz up into the many megahertz or gigahertz. And the principle of this, basically, is when an AC signal travels through a piece of wire, as you increase the frequency, this, the signal, the electrons if you like, start to travel closer and closer and closer to the edge of the wire. And by some magic principle that Marconi discovered, if you increase the frequency enough, the signal starts to travel outside of the wire. And this high frequency is actually broadcast away from the wire. And you can take another piece of wire, called an antenna, an aerial, and use this to pick up the signal that's being radiated from this other piece of wire, the other side of the Atlantic, yeah? And that's magic, if you ask me. But that's how it works.
So in the early days of radio, effectively, you would take your RF signal. You may or may not amplify it. So you may have an RF amplifier, or you may just take the signal, and you feed it into a tuned circuit, which is basically a combination of inductors and capacitors. So this is your tuned circuit, yeah? The tuned circuit, basically, all the frequencies come in, but coming out of it is just the frequency you want, the frequency of your radio station, and not all of the radio stations, yeah? This then would go into another amplifier to amplify it some more, but now you're amplifying just the one frequency, not all of them, yeah? And then it goes into the detector, which is basically taking the audio signal away from the RF signal. With AM radio, that's amplitude modulated, and what it means is, basically, you have a carrier radio frequency, let's say at one megahertz, which is somewhere in the medium wave band, yeah? And you modulate the amplitude of the signal like so. So you take your audio signal, yeah? And effectively, your radio frequency is fitting inside it. That's how the radio frequency carries the information. This is the information, the audio signal. This is the radio frequency, the carrier. Yeah. FM, by the way, the amplitude is always the same, which effectively means that you've always got the same power coming out of the transmitter. Instead of altering the amplitude, the power, you alter the frequency a little bit around a certain carrier frequency. So you, if the carrier frequency, say, was 88 megahertz, your audio is used to move that slightly a bit each way, yeah? By, you know, tens of kilohertz, whatever audio, 20 kilohertz is probably enough for audio. So that's how that works. So this detector is a circuit that will extract either information as the circuit is designed. After your detector, you would then normally, now you only have the audio frequency, so all the RF is gone. This goes into an audio amplifier, and that goes to your speaker. Yeah. That's how it basically works. Problem with this circuit is that these amplifiers are having to amplify a very wide range of frequencies. So as you tune your circuit, this amplifier is working, amplifying the frequency of that, at that transmission, whether it's 1 megahertz, 1.5 megahertz, 800 kilohertz, or whatever. And to make an amplifier that works well at a very wide of range of frequencies is difficult. So, some clever guys, around the time of the First World War, by the way, with quite primitive equipment, came up with something called superheterodyne, or superhet. So how superhet radio works is, you may have an RF amplifier to increase the sensitivity. You might not. Coming out of the RF amp or directly from your antenna, the signal goes into a mixer. Okay? And feeding into the mixer is a local oscillator. It's called a local oscillator. It's an oscillating circuit. And this feeds into... Oops, I've drawn it in the wrong place. I've already drawn it. And this feeds into the mixer, okay? So that's your oscillator. The way this is designed is the oscillator, you can tune, yeah? So you can change the frequency of the oscillator. And this is how the tuning works. Coming out of the mixer are two things, four things. That's two and another two I just thought of, yeah? When you make a mixer like this, coming out of it, you'll have one, the original RF frequency, the frequency of the radio station, yeah? Two, you'll have the oscillator frequency. Three, you'll have the sum of the two together, yeah? So if this is one megahertz and this is 1.2 megahertz, you'll have a 1.2 megahertz signal, 
you'll have a one megahertz signal and you'll have the sum of the two which is 2.2 .2 megahertz yeah the sum and the fourth thing that comes out is the one that we want it's the difference yeah so you get a signal which is the difference between the two frequencies but the difference will always be the same so if you set this to be one megahertz and the radio frequency is at 1.2 megahertz the difference signal will be 200 megahertz so 200 kilohertz yeah if you change this down for example to 800 kilohertz and you happen to have a radio station at one megahertz yeah that radio station will come through but the frequency it will be on will be 200 kilohertz yeah if you increase this oscillator to 1.2 megahertz and you happen to have a radio station that's on 1.4 megahertz then this radio station will come through but the difference will be 200 kilohertz so coming out of this is what's called an IF or intermediate frequency and it's always the same it doesn't have to be 200 kilohertz I just picked a random amount there are set amounts I think it's 250 kilohertz for radio and about 450 for TV or something like that was it 450 megahertz anyway there are set frequencies but at the moment we don't need to know them and we can look them up if we want to know them because you now have this IF frequency you can put in here a filter yeah and coming out of the filter is only the 200 megahertz nothing else yeah and now you can amplify this and because you're always amplifying the same frequency the amplifier is much easier to design you can make amplifiers at a much higher gain than these amplifiers so you can boost the signal a lot therefore making it much more sensitive then we have same as before the detector which takes the information modulating the signal you have your audio amp and you have your speaker like so there you go please all you radio amateurs out there i'll just mention this is a basic principle of how this works listen guys i'm a jack of all trades yeah you know by now i'm a jack of all trades and what they say is jack of all trades is master of none of them yeah and that's me okay so you can comment below but that to me is enough understanding to know something important and that is that our chip on our radio board must have a local oscillator and it must have two of them one for am and the other one for fm this will be much higher frequency than this one and if the oscillator isn't running the radio will will not work okay so let richard jack of all trades tell you that you can still get your comments below see if i'm that bothered yeah <laughs> no guys i listen to all of you I'm, I'm, I'm joking now let's go back to our board enough of that and let's see if the oscillators are running yeah so here is our diagram and we have an fm oscillator and an am oscillator and we know what they are doing now they are producing the signal which is a difference between this oscillator and the incoming radio frequency to amplify and detect while I'm here I did mention it let's have a quick look to see what the standard frequencies are for the IF or intermediate frequency amplifiers well I just googled for it AM radio IF frequency and I found both so on an AM radio receiver it's about 455 kilohertz and on an FM receiver 10.7 yeah so those are the two common IF frequencies so our oscillator will be running depending on the position of the tuner at 455 kilohertz less than the incoming frequency so our oscillator is going to be between about 80 kilohertz at the bottom end of the range and about 1.15 yes and about 1.15 megahertz at the top end of the range 
we're not going to bother with the FM receiver for now. Let's see if we get the AM receiver working. If that's working and not the FM, well, we'll have to look at this, won't we? So now we know what we're looking for in the way of oscillator frequency. Back to the data sheet then. Let's have a quick look again. We know, because we've just Googled it, that on pin 20, we're going to have somewhere in the 90 kilohertz to a megahertz, something like that, depending on position of the tuning knob. And this is about 10 megahertz. But we're not too worried about that at the moment. We want to look at this one. So let's use our meter on hertz mode and see if we can see if the oscillator is running. If we can't see anything, we may well have to try with an oscilloscope. It depends if the meter is sensitive enough to actually pick up the oscillator or not. I have the meter on frequency range hertz. We'll just power the uh, device back up again. And let's have a look to see if we can see anything on pin 20. So I'll connect one end to ground and the other end to pin 20. 4, 3, 2, 1, 20. And we've just seen 50 hertz. We've not seen any sort of oscillation on there. I'm, out, I'm on AM position. AM, definitely. So let's have like 4, 3, 2, 1, 20. Yeah, just seen 50 hertz. I've not seen anything on there. Let's try the same thing with the oscilloscope and see if that will show us a signal. Here's the oscilloscope. So let's have a look to see if our local oscillator is actually running. So it's on pin 20 of the chip. I'll just get onto it. There. And yes, it is running. Now, I'm on a setting of about one microsecond to di per division. And that frequency, one, two, three, four, five, it's pretty much on one microsecond. That's one megahertz. Let me just adjust the tuning knob. Oh, yeah, so we can now increase the frequency of the oscillator. So at this point, we have two cycles per division. That's two megahertz. So our oscillator is running like one to two megahertz, something like that. I'll go down to the lowest frequency. Okay, let's see where the tuning says it's set to now. Yeah, so that's at the bottom end of the AM band. And then it goes upwards. So it suggests to me that the frequency of the local oscillator is rather higher than I thought it would be. But I don't know this chip. I mean, it's going in a range. Let's have a look. So it's going from about 1 megahertz. Let me go to the maximum frequency. That's the maximum. And that's about 2 megahertz. I've got about 1 megahertz of range. Now, if you look at the, our tuning knob on the receiver, on the bottom display, you see that's 1.6 megahertz. So... If our frequency of our local oscillator is 2 megahertz, that's about 400 above here. So the intermediate frequency, yeah, it's about 400, 400 kilohertz, what we'd expect. But the local oscillator is higher than the incoming rather than lower. At the bottom end, it's about 1 megahertz, and this is going to about 530. So is the difference staying the same? I think it probably is. I mean... 600 to 1 is 4, yeah. And 1600 to 2 is 4. And I wasn't really reading that accurately on the oscilloscope. So I'm actually sure that our local oscillator is giving us an IF frequency of about 400 kilohertz, which is what the Wikipedia said we should have. We know the oscillator is running then. So let's have another look at our chip. So this is the mixer, AM mixer. So we know coming out of here, we will have basically the sum of the two frequencies, the oscillator plus the radio station frequency, 
the difference, which is the one that we want, and both original frequencies, the oscillator frequency and the radio station frequency. So that comes out here through this little tuned circuit, and this is part of the tuned circuit. So coming in here is the IF, the intermediate frequency. So this is the 400 odd kilohertz frequency that we know of, we know we have on AM, IF. And this should have our radio station on it if we tune to one. So let's have a look to see if we can see anything coming in here. And I can move the tuning control across to see what we have. So this is pin seven of our circuit. So let's go on to pin seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. Pin seven. Here. Well, we seem to have something on there. Can we actually see it? Yeah, we have something going on on there. Let me just alter the tuning control across the band. So let's just change the. Ah! Well, there we have effectively a single frequency as you would expect. Certainly on part of the radio band, it's there. And the fact it's kind of like jittering around makes me think there might be some sort of signal on it, some sort of radio station, maybe. But it's only there for part of the band. As we go further down, it's not there. Okay, it's back again. Yeah, it's only there as on part of the tuning range. Have we got any audio coming out of our chip? Let's have a look at the data sheet again. So the audio should come out here on pins 13 and 14. Let's have a look to see if we've got any output from this. Pins 13 and 14 then, which are down here. What do we have? Oh, well, something on there. I need to probably reduce the sensitivity a bit and reduce the time base a little bit. Because this might actually be an audio signal. What have we got? Yeah, I mean that looks like, it looks like to me, looks like an audio signal, there's something coming out of the chip. Yeah, we could have just altered the tuning range and I have something there. I have something there, so why have we got no audio, if we've got audio coming out of the chip, I mean that comes to... Uh, when it comes to here. Oh, so like there's audio coming out of there, but there's nothing on the connector here. Let's see if that actually is an audio signal. So if I take um, my PC speakers one moment. This is the input to my speakers. You probably hear them clicking. I touch it, yeah. So if we probe where this audio is with this, we should be able to hear whatever is on there. I'll have to wrap a bit of wire around here, just take me one moment. In fact, no, I have a better plan. So this is just like a, a lead I keep, it's just got a meter preamp on both ends basically. So if I touch that with there and then use this end to probe on our chip, can we hear anything? Well, just a hissy noise. That, that signal is just hiss, basically. Let me try uh, fasten this on with a crocodile clip, and I'll try alter the tuning while we're doing it. Okay, I've done that. So, I can hear a clicky on the speakers. It's not very loud. You might not hear it very well. Let's see what we get now. So let's get back onto here. I'm sure you heard that. So I'm all to the tuning knob. And it's just making strange noises. Let's go to FM. Let's put it to FM. Let's try it again. And again, I'm tuning across the range. Oh, 
Can you hear it? I'm sure you can hear it, it's be quiet on the microphone. I do appear to have a radio station there very weak. Let's just go with the lead directly onto here again. I think I think there's losing quite a lot down the crocodile that I'll clip. So again, onto there. Onto our chip. And now we know we tuned into something. Yeah, there's kind of something there, faint. Right, so the chip has given us nothing out on the AM, just a hissing noise, and it's giving us effectively maybe a weak radio station on FM. I think most likely this chip has got a problem. I'm just wondering why we don't get any audio coming from here. So this is the audio out from the board. Again, we don't seem to get anything, yeah. Let me just have a quick look, see if I can figure out, because I can't seem to easily get this board off here, how that connects back to our chip. I couldn't work it out without removing the PCB, so I've actually got this off now, it's just very stiff to get off risking breaking it but i didn't break it so i actually have it here now and we can see where the audio signal is actually coming from so these these two pins here this one and this one is actually the audio and you can see it runs down two tracks here with like a, a kind of a, a grounded one in between them or somewhere it comes to here and if you have a look you can see that from the audio here actually comes to here yeah and the same for the other one so this is where the audio is coming from and this is on both sides a zero ohm resistor so one here and one here effectively and from this side, there's a, uh, I think it's a 12k resistor after the zero ohm. Let's just uh, go on to ohms range and we can have a look. Ohms range. So after the zero ohm, this is a 12k resistor in here, and we can just check that. So from the end of the zero ohm to here, we have here we have like 12k. And if we go on the other input. Which I think is this one. We have 12k. And that goes to a capacitor. There's one capacitor here. And one here. And you can see them on the other side of the board. We have two electrolytic capacitors. These ones down here, okay? And these ones are actually in the audio path. The other side of the capacitors goes to the output so this is the output pins 13 and 14 on the radio chip but if I go from the capacitor which is here the other end of the electrolytic I don't have a connection yeah it's not, I don't have a connection there and the same on the other one which is here I don't have a connection and it's because there's a lot of corrosion on here from what I can see so these are the tracks running from the capacitor to the chip and the other one is here. If we go on the chip onto continuity, so we'll hear the bleep. I've got continuity, yeah? But as I go up the track, it's gone, it's lost, yeah? I have it there, but I don't have it on the capacitor. There's a break in the track or corrosion or something here. And the same on the other one. So I go from here, this is the track. 
didn't even get a contact on it. Yeah, we can't act on it. But it doesn't go to here yet. It doesn't go up the track. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean all this crap off with some isopropyl alcohol. Make these connections with a bit of wire if I need to, to the capacitors from the chip. And then let's see if it works. Okay, I've uh, soldered two bits of wire in, as you can see. I now have continuity from here to the ends of the capacitors. So let's see if the radio is actually working now we're ready to go I've just balanced the PCB in here for now so uh, we're on FM now uh, let's see I mean this is the antenna this tiny little thing oh okay okay AM Nothing but It's definitely working on FM So there we have it then it's working. I actually suspect there are probably no AM radio stations on the island, to be quite honest. I'm mean, like 130 miles off the coast of West Africa, you know, in the middle of the ocean. So you probably wouldn't pick up anything on AM. Doesn't surprise me. I've never heard mention of any AM stations on the island. Obviously, we have quite a lot of FM stations. You can hear them there, and it's working now. So that's what it was. It was corrosion on the other side of the board basically and you know rotted through some of the tracks i hope you enjoyed that video anyway i think it was uh, quite interesting really hopefully some of you have learned something along the way with that one and although i don't really need this device it was a lot of fun that's for sure if you'd like to see more of this sort of thing i mean there's a lot of like retro radio equipment and stuff at the uh, car boot i'm happy to buy some more if you want to learn more about repairing it but i think you've probably got a very good grounding there on how to get started and hopefully you'll know a lot more about radio than you did before you started watching this video anyway it's the weekend guys so have a good time enjoy yourselves it's public holiday on monday so i won't be back at least until tuesday just enjoy the sun yeah okay guys See you all soon on another Learning Electronics Repair video. Ciao for now, guys.